بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الامي وعلى اله وسلم تسليما The next Sahabi in our list of the shining stars is Azad Julaybib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. We have very little information about him. There's not much about him in the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I looked a lot in many, many different books. But I found mainly two incidents about him that tell us a lot about who he was and his situation and his biography. And though our information is very little, there's a very important lesson that can be learned from his life. And that's why I chose to include him in the shining stars. Even amongst the Sahaba, he was very much unknown. In fact, he was shunned in his society, in the Arab society. And there was, there was two reasons behind this. Number one, he was physically very ugly, appearance-wise. He was very short in stature, very dark in complexion, very ugly. And to the extent that men didn't like him sitting in their gatherings. So, as an alternative, he had no choice but to sit with the woman. So he would sit with the woman and talk with the woman and he had a dwarf-like uh, stature so he would sit with the woman almost like a kid amongst women we could say his name before I begin talking about the two incidents his name Julaybib something we should know about Arabic uh, grammar a little bit this sound A Julay it's a, in Arabic, whenever this sound comes, the A sound in a noun, it refers to tasqeed form. In other words, diminutive, making something smaller. And this form in Arabic language is used for a couple of reasons. Sometimes to show something to be as it is, physically very small. Sometimes it's to show cuteness. Something is very small, it's very cute. For example, there's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa about one sahabi who was a child, he was very cute, and he had a little bird that he kept as a pet. So he said, Umair, ma fa'ala no ghair. Ya Umair, ma fa'ala no ghair. Right? And sometimes it was used for humiliation. And that was the situation of Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala. So there was two, two things that were not in his favor. Number one was his appearance, his stature, his height. And number two, no one knew where he came from. He didn't have a lineage. Nobody knew who his father was. In Arab society, that was a big drawback. Because you had no family, you had no tribe. In times of difficulty, you have nobody to support you. Even though the strangest thing about Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala anhu was that he was from Medina. But it almost seems like his parents deserted him, maybe because of the way he looked, that he never had a lineage. And so he was neither Julaybib ibn, Julaybib the son of, and nor was he Julaybib Mawla, even a freed slave of someone. We read about Thoban, at least he was Mawla Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had some connection. Right? And we had Wail ibn Hujar, and we have Abdullah Dhul Bajadain ibn Abd Naham. But Julaybib was neither a Mawla of anyone, neither was he a Ibn, a son of anyone. So he was basically someone who was unknown, completely unknown. So these were two things that made him an outcast in the society. But the lesson that we learn from the two incidents that we're going to talk about in his life are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are chosen to be his messengers, they don't look at the appearances and they don't look at the wealth. They only look at the condition of the heart. There's a very famous hadith about this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Inna Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa amwalikum walakin yanzuru ila qulubikum wa a'amalikum. Allah does not look at your appearances. He does not look at your status, your wealth. 
He looks at your actions and he looks at your hearts. His life is a beautiful example of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were only looking at the heart, they were not looking at his appearance. The first incident is a narration from Abi Barza al Aslami radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says that one day I told my wife that, you know, this Julaybib, he always comes and sits amongst the woman folk. If he decides to come today and sit in the gathering with you woman, I'm going to do this to him and I'm going to do that to him. So you make sure that he doesn't sit in amongst you. There's a threat. This is how much they disliked him. It so happened that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he wanted to get Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala anhu married. How are you going to get a person like this married? Who's going to give their daughter to him? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa called Julaybib and he said, Julaybib, I want to get you married off. So Jalibib Radilan responded, he said, he said, Idan Tajiduni Kasidan. You won't find anybody to marry me, Ya Rasulullah. Kasidan means uh, somebody something that's not sellable. You can put it in the market, but nobody will buy it. So you'll find me an unsellable product. Nobody's gonna ever take me. Nobody's gonna accept me for their daughter. Rasulullah sallallahu said something very beautiful. He said, وَلَكِنْ لَسْتَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَاسِدًا But in the eyes of Allah, you are very, very valuable. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are a very great person. He loves you dearly. And I'm going to get you married if you're willing. Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. If you, are, if you want to get married and you are my guardian and, I'm, and, and you can find someone for me, Bismillah, I'm, all, I'm willing to get married inshallah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he started looking. Now it was a habit amongst the Ansar and the Muhajireen. If there was any woman available who was not yet married, the first thing they would do is they would come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and present her to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if he wanted to marry her. So there's a Sahabi, he has a daughter. And she's at the age that she can get married now. So that sahabi would come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he would say, Ya Rasulullah, would you like to marry my daughter? So one such sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to him one day and he said, Ya Rasulullah, my daughter is available. Do you have any need to get married, Ya Rasulullah? He said, no. He said, he said, Zawwajni ibnatak. Get me married to your daughter. He said, Subhanallah, Ya Rasulullah, for sure I'll get you married. But Rasulullah Sallallahu said, no. Not for me. For Jalaybib. He said, for Jalaybib, Ya Rasulullah? He said, yes, for Jalaybib. He said, let me consult with my wife. So, he went back home and he came to his wife and he said, I want to give you congratulations. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is willing to marry our daughter. So she said, Subhanallah, right away. He said, no, 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 no. Not for himself. For Jalaybib. So she said three times, is in the narration three times. Julaybib? Julaybib. You mean him, Julaybib? Wallahi, never. Laha, wallahi. Idan, never. It can never happen. It can never happen. I cannot marry my daughter to him. The daughter was inside another room and she heard this whole conversation going on. 
And she said, Hal turduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Are you rejecting a proposal from the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Who's speaking? The mother is rejected, the father is rejecting. But the daughter is saying, Hal turduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Are you rejecting a proposal from the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? لَنْ يُضَيَّعَنِي abada. He's not one to ever waste me. He loves me more than you love me. I'm more of a daughter to him than my daughter to you. He would never throw me away just to anybody. If he wants me to get married to Jalaybib, then let me get married to Jalaybib. The father was very proud of his daughter for saying this. And at this time, an ayah of Qur'an was revealed upon Rasulullah A very beautiful ayah that we can learn something from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's an ayah of Surah Ahzab, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It is not for a mu'min believer or a, or a mu'mina believer that when the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and the Rasul and the decision of Rasulullah sallallahu comes upon them that they make any decision of their own after that. When the decision has been made for you by Allah and His Prophet wasallam, then don't draw your own opinions or make your own decisions. No, I want to do it like this. No, it should be like this. Know that whatever decision Allah and His Rasul wasallam, are making for you is better for you than even you know. Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. Sometimes you dislike something but it's better for you. There's a rule that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in the Qur'an. So this ayah was revealed. The father was very proud of his daughter and he said, Subhanallah, she's speaking the truth. Whatever she said is absolutely correct. It is the weakness of our iman. He got up and he went straight to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to give our daughter over to you to give to Julaybib. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Bismillah. And Julaybi was married to her. There was a specific dua that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made for this girl because of her decision that she had made. Be- very beautiful dua. He said, Allahumma subba alayha khayra sabban. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ عَيْشَهَا كَدًّا كَدًّا There's a dua he made when that father came to him and told him that my daughter said that she wants to get married to Jalebi because it's your order, Ya Rasulullah. So he made this dua right away. Allah, make her life such that it's full of khair. Pour rain of khair upon her life. And do not make her life a life of toil and hardship. كَدًّا kadda. The dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he made for her. And Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that because of this dua, we found that of all the families in Medina Munawwara and all the homes in Medina Munawwara, her house was the most wealthiest and her house was the most, uh, had the most barakah and the blessings in it and they were the happiest family in all of Medina Munawwara. We did not find a family that was more wealthy and more happier than her family. Always. After this marriage between Julaybib and that daughter. This is the first incident that's related about Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala. Shortly after he was married, Faza al Medina. The hadith mentions Faza al Medina. A shock wave came to Medina Munawwara. In other words, a, a threat came from outside that some army, some of the mushrikeen are gathering to attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina Munawwara. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathered the sahaba and they went out on an expedition. It's mentioned, not mentioned in the hadith which expedition this was. There's no mention in the hadith. But Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala who also participated in this expedition. 
when the war was over, the battle was over between the mushrikeen and the muslimin, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa called the sahaba and he said, Hal tafqiduna min ahadin? Go and see who's missing from amongst us. So the sahaba went and they came back and they said, Ya Rasulullah, this person's missing, this person's missing, this person's missing. This person's missing. In other words, these are the people who have become martyred. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, again, asking the same question. Hal tafqiduna min ahadin? He's trying to make a point. Hal tafqiduna min ahadin? Is there anyone missing? So they look around at each other again and see, okay, who amongst us was with us in the beginning and who's not with us now? And one or two other names came up. Third time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the same question. Is there anyone missing amongst you? So now the Sahaba are getting that, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking this for a specific reason. Why is he asking the same question over and over again? So they looked around and maybe one or two names came up again and said, Ya Rasulullah, that's one or two people and that's it. Really, we don't think there's anyone else missing, just the names that we mentioned. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Wala afqidu julaybib. I don't see Julaybib anywhere. Where is he? How come you never thought about his name? I don't see Julaybib anywhere. Where is Julaybib? Now go and look for his body. So all the Sahaba went out into the battlefield and they started looking for the body of Julaybib radiallahu ta'ala. They looked and looked and looked and they finally found him. And they found him in a state that there were seven mushrikeen around him and he was in the middle of them, martyred. In other words, he killed seven of them before he himself was martyred. Despite the shortness of his stature and his weakness, he killed seven people before he himself was martyred. So they came to Rasulullah running and they said, Ya Rasulullah, فَإِذَا هُوَ قُتِلَ إِلَى فَإِذَا هُوَ فَإِذَا هُوَ قَتَلَ إِلَى جَنْبِهِ سَبَعَةً فَقَدْ قَتَلَهُمْ ثُمَّ قَتَلُوهُ Ya Rasulullah, you won't believe that he killed seven people and not until he killed seven people they, and then they killed him and then he was martyred on his own, single-handedly. Subhanallah. Even they were amazed. The Sahaba were amazed. So Rasulullah Sallallahu said, take me to him. So Rasulullah the Sahaba held Rasulullah Sallallahu hand and they took him where his body was. So Rasulullah Sallallahu stood over his body and he said a very beautiful thing that he only has said about one other Sahabi. He's only said this about one other Sahabi. And that was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who has such a high rank. He's the fourth Khalif of the Muslimin, and we know many of his virtues. He said, Hada minni wa ana minhu. He is from me, and I am from him. Subhanallah. He is from me, and I am from him. He had no family, but I am his family. قَتَلَ سَبْعَةً ثُمَّ قَتَلُوا He killed seven and then he was killed? SubhanAllah. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is praising his work. هَذَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْهُ He said this three times. هَذَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْهُ قَتَلَ سَبْعَةً ثُمَّ قَتَلُوهُ هَذَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْهُ Then he told the Sahaba to dig his grave in front of him. And while they dug his grave, Rasulullah Sallallahu took his body and he laid his head on his forearms. And until they hadn't dug his grave, which would take an hour, two hours, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi laid with him on his lap, on his forearms. And the Sahabi said that, مَا لَهُ سَرِيرْ إِلَّا سَعِدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He did not have a pillow except the forearm of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi 
Rasulullah sat there until they finished digging the grave and he was on the forearm of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There was a lesson that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was teaching the Sahaba and he's teaching us is that we cannot judge people by their appearances. You have to look at the condition of the heart. There is another Sahabi. His name was Zahir ibn Haram. And his situation is very related to uh, Jalaybi radiallahu in the sense that he also in appearance was very ugly. But he had a family. His name was Zahir ibn Haram. And he was a wealthy businessman. And he lived in a village outside of Medina Munawwara. Rasulullah loved him a lot. He loved him a lot. So the Sahaba used to say, kind of, Zahir ibn Haram. Rasulullah loved Zahir ibn Haram a lot. Rasulullah used to say about him, Nahnu hadiruhu wa innahu badiyatuna. We are his city and he is our village. Because whenever he used to come to Medina Munawwara, he used to bring things that only were found in the villages and he would present them to Rasulullah And before he used to leave for his village, Rasulullah would give him some things of the city and he would take those with him to his village. Once Rasulullah went to visit him and he was selling his stuff in the market. So Rasulullah tiptoed behind him quietly. And he tiptoed and then he covered him from behind his eyes. And Zahir radiallahu ta'ala who is like, who is this? Manant, who are you? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi stayed quiet. So then he tried to struggle and he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi When he saw it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, pu- he pushed himself back against the chest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi to gain more barakah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in humor, Man yashtar al-abd, who's going to buy this slave? So Zahir ibn Haram radiallahu ta'ala said, he said, Ya Rasulullah, don't even bother to sell me even if I'm not a slave because who's going to buy me? He said the same thing that Jalaybib radiallahu ta'ala who said, he said, Idhan tajiduni kasidhan, you'll find me, I'm not a sellable product. Who's going to buy me? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Walakin indallahi anta ghalin, in the eyes of Allah, you are very, very valuable. Same lesson being taught in the story of Zahir ibn Haram that's being taught in Jalaybib radiallahu ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq to follow the ways of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majmain and to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every aspect of our life. As you can see, the Sahaba didn't only consist of Abu Bakr's and Umar's and Uthman's and Ali's. There were so many different types of Sahaba. We had the Wali ibn Hujar and we had the Thoban. And we had the Abdullah Dhul Bijadain, the ascetic who just does dhikr. That's all. He doesn't do anything else. And then we have Thoban Radiyallan, who's trying to spread the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's calling the governor, how come you don't visit me? If, it was, uh, if I was the Mawla of Musa or Isa Alayhi Salam, you would have come to visit me. So I'm the Mawla of Musa or Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How come you're not coming to visit me? And after he came, he just narrates a hadith to him. And then you have Julaybi radiallahu ta'ala anhu here. So you see the different types of Sahaba radwan Allah majmain that were handpicked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to become the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every single one of them has a story to tell. Every single one of them has a lesson to tell. And in the future, whenever we open the books of hadith and read the names of some of these Sahaba in the hadith like Thoban, we'll at least know who they are. It's not just, okay, we're narrating the hadith. We know who this person is and you recognize, oh, this is Thawban. I know who Thawban, Mawla Rasulullah is. Oh, Wail ibn Hujar, I know who Wail ibn Hujar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is. Who said that I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I was praying behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said his amin out loud. This is the Wail ibn Hujar who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only twice in his lifetime. He was of royal descent. He was a Yemeni. It gives you a closer relationship.
somebody you know personally, you have, have a more lovable, more loving relationship with them. So when you read their hadith, you think about them in a different way. That's the whole point of this session that we're holding, that we have a cl more personal relationship with the Sahaba Ridwan of Ali We know them more personally, we get to know them more personally, we love them better. It's just like the example, you know, sometimes in our communities, we know someone from our community, and we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and we meet them, you know, just basic greetings, but not on a personal level, you know, like families are knowing each other and meeting with each other, and we're going to each other's houses, nothing like that. But then it so happens that we're both going for hajj on the same year. And you go for hajj, you go through many different experiences together. Right? You go through different experiences together. And that produces a bond, a very personal, loving bond with, amongst you. You go through the hajj together, you go through those different experiences together, right? the ups and downs. And, and when you come back, now you have this special relationship. The same type of special relationship and bond that we want to create with the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majmain. And I encourage all of us that let's not suffice with just what we know. We should go deeper into the biographies. Open the books and read the biographies of the Sahaba. There's a lot of mawad, a lot of matan in English, in Arabic, in Urdu, a lot of it in English now that we can read about the biographies of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majmain. We have Hayatul Sahaba. It's a beautiful book. And I was just reading again today about uh, Sheikh Nuhamim Keller, that his Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al shaghuri he always used to teach the Hayat al-Sahaba to his students. To tell them that when you're treading the spiritual path, remember, after all your dhikr and all your ibadah, it's only accepted in the eyes of Allah if you're leading your life according to the way of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah you do your dhikr, you do your ibadah, but you lead your life in a way different from the way of the sahaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want it. You're on the spiritual path, you have to follow the path of the sahaba radwan Allah majmain. So this is the whole purpose behind this. And I hope that this motivates inshallah us to build a, uh, to, to read more about the sahaba radwan Allah majmain. For that I would definitely recommend hayatul sahaba. And of course also that it produces a bond between us and the Sahaba whose names that we are, uh, whose Sahaba, the Sahaba who we are discussing in these 30 days of Ramadan. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al mursani wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khair. And he was a mahram, which means that it was haram for him to sit amongst the woman. Then why was he sitting amongst the woman? Remember, the ayah about hijab was revealed in the seventh year of hijrah. Before that, it doesn't mean that they used to sit amongst each other, but there was not that much strictness as there was after the ayah was revealed. And that's the main reason why we see that Jurebi radiallahu ta'ala anhu would be sitting amongst the woman, that most likely it was because it was before this ayah was revealed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not as strict in the matter because the ayah was not revealed. Yes, Amir al-Mu'minin Umar ibn Khattab was very strict about this, even before the ayah was revealed. And he would always insist upon Rasulullah when is an order going to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to separate? Once he saw the wife of Rasulullah Sauda radiallahu anha. Sauda radiallahu anha was very big. She was large and big in height and wide. So he saw her once in the darkness he recognized her and he said, Soda, I recognize you. In other words, he wanted to tell her to go tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, Ya Rasulullah, he recognized me. Maybe we should do something now. And soon after, the ayah of hijab was revealed. So the likelihood is that this whole uh, incident was before the ayah of hijab. And if that is the case, then that means that Jalebi Bradilan Shahada obviously happened in one of the expeditions that took place before the seventh year of Hijrah. Jazakumullah khairah. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu al-mursilun. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.